Hello and welcome to our final video lesson on Chapter 2, Aqueous Chemistry. In this lesson we'll be examining pH homeostasis. First, however, let's review a principle from the previous lesson regarding the effective pH range for a buffering system. Remember that's one pH unit above and below pK, or pH equals pK plus and minus 1. At the upper range, that would be pK plus 1, and remember this is a logarithmic scale, and so in order to get plus 1, that would mean we would take the log of the value 10. In other words, this means that the concentration of the conjugate base at this upper limit is 10 times that of the concentration of the weak acid. At the lower end of our effective range, that would be pK minus 1. Again, on a log scale, to get a negative value, that means we're taking the log of a number less than 1. In this case, it would be taking the log of 0.1. That would mean that the concentration of the conjugate base is one-tenth that of the acid. Or putting it in terms of whole numbers, the concentration of the acid is 10 times that of its conjugate base. So here's our convenient rule of thumb for determining the effective range for a buffering system. pH is equal to pK plus or minus 1, or that buffers tend to resist changes in pH when the concentrations of the acid and its conjugate base differ by no more than a factor of 10. This will be convenient rule of thumb to keep in mind when you're calculating acid and base problems. Now we want to look at one of the most important buffering systems in the human body. It's used to maintain pH homeostasis in blood. Our normal internal pH hovers around 7, 6.9 to 7.4. Keep in mind this is a log scale, so that's still a difference in concentration. Our problem is that in the carrying out of normal metabolic functions, we generate acid. And we'll see this more particularly in segment 3 of the course. So the question is, how do we adjust the pH back to this neutral range? One of the most important buffering systems involves carbon dioxide. It dissolves in blood to form carbonic acid, H2CO3, and here's our equilibrium expression. CO2 plus water forms carbonic acid, H2CO3, but the pK is around 3.6, very low, so it readily dissociates to H+, remember that could also be denoted as H3O+, plus, plus bicarbonate, HCO3-. minus. So the question is, how do we use this equilibrium to buffer the blood? This equilibrium occurs spontaneously, but there's a rather impressive enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, that helps the process along. can speed it up a billion or even a trillion fold, as we'll see when we get to chapters 6 and 7. The lungs expel CO2 gas, and that pulls the equilibrium away from low pH. So in this, you'll want to observe the equilibrium expression at the top of the slide here, and keep in mind the law of mass action. So in an equilibrium expression, if we're pulling something away, as in the case of the CO2 here, we're pulling the equilibrium in that direction and away from the formation of H+, away from low pH. So then changes in lung function can adjust our blood pH in minutes or hours. But what if we want a more long-term way of adjusting pH, something that would adjust the pH in a manner that would persist over a longer period of time? The kidneys play a major role in buffering metabolic acids. They filter bicarbonate from the bloodstream into what's called the kidney filtrate, and that's part of our diagram here. On the left of our diagram, this is the filtrate. This is what has been filtered by the kidneys from the bloodstream. And we want to use the bicarbonate in the bloodstream to buffer the acids inside the cell. So we need some way to get that bicarbonate inside the cell. The problem is it's charged, and we know these cells are surrounded by a lipid bilayer, and so it will not spontaneously diffuse into the cell. We need some way of getting it 
inside the cell. And here's how that process works. In the first step, labeled 1 on our diagram here, an antiporter moves protons out of the cell at the same time it moves sodium inside the cell. This is an ion exchanger. Those protons in point 2 of our diagram here will combine with the car bicarbonate to form CO2. This can occur spontaneously, but remember we have that impressive enzyme to make this happen a lot faster. CO2 is neutral and also nonpolar, so it readily diffuses across the membrane and very rapidly. And so now the CO2 can diffuse inside the cell. What occurs next is that CO2 can be converted back to bicarbonate and H+. Again, this happens spontaneously, but carbonic anhydrase can significantly increase this process. And now we have the bicarbonate we need to neutralize the acid. The protons we generate, remember, will get pumped back out of the cell so that they don't accumulate inside the cell. We have effectively moved bicarbonate from the filtrate inside the cell, but by this rather indirect method. You'll see this as a very common theme in biochemical systems, where things are done in a more indirect way. In this process, we see that metabolites are in constant motion, and that's going to be an important principle to keep in mind throughout the rest of the semester. Perhaps at this point you're wondering, why don't we just have a transporter for bicarbonate to move it inside the cell? And we could do that. As we'll see in a later chapter, there are many of these types of transporters or exchangers that work in biological systems. That process is a little bit slower, though. Carbonic anhydrase is very fast, can very quickly convert the bicarbonate to CO2, and civil diffusion is faster than transport of ions. And this allows us to adjust the pH very rapidly. Many of the proteins and enzymes and molecules inside the cell are extremely sensitive to pH. And so it's important we be able to adjust the pH very rapidly. And this allows us to do this in this rather indirect way. But now if the kidney cell continues to do this and use bicarbonate, extract it from the bloodstream to neutralize the acids inside the cell, we're deplenishing the bicarbonate in the bloodstream and now we're going to run into a problem of maintaining the pH of the blood. And remember the blood is supplying these ions and metabolites to other cells as well. So in order to replenish what is taken from the bloodstream, the kidney cell, through normal metabolic processes, will generate CO2. And just as we saw in the previous slide, this can rapidly be converted to bicarbonate and H+. The H+, is pumped out through a proton pump into the filtrate, and that goes out through the urine, is just excreted as waste. And the bicarbonate is transport it back into the bloodstream to replenish what was taken. In this case we use an ion exchanger that pumps the bicarbonate out of the cell and the chloride inside the cell. So you can see that the cell does indeed have a bicarbonate transporter, but in this case we're moving bicarbonate out of the cell. Remember, this is a slower process. It's less critical that we replenish the bicarbonate we've taken out. It's more important we have a rapid way of adjusting pH, and that's by this rather circuitous way that we saw in the previous slide. So this is one of the most important buffering systems in the human body. There are others that operate inside the cell. Phosphate is one, as we'll discuss in class more particularly. This concludes then our studies in Chapter 2. Again, these are very important principles that we're going to refer to throughout the semester, and you'll want to make sure that these things are clear in your mind. This concludes our studies in Chapter 2. For now, we're going to skip Chapter 3, and we'll return to consider that along with Chapter 20 towards the end of the semester. So our next video lesson will pick up with our studies in Chapter 4. We'll consider the general structure of an amino acid as well as the classifications for the 20 common amino acids.